Well, good morning, loved ones. Isn't it lovely to be able to say that? Because we're family. I just wait till everyone gets settled. I was just looking at the pictures of all the Nets courses around here. And when I get to Nets 4, <laughs> I remember because I first came to teach here in 1999. And I've taught in every Nets course. This is my 20th year. <laughs> I remember I came so nervous the first, uh, <laughs> the first days. I actually, before the course started, I walked right and round the field saying, Lord, why am I here? Can I go home? <laughs> Honestly, I, 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 in fact, I spent the previous day on the floor in my face saying, Lord, please help me because I have no idea why I'm here. How can anybody teach on any one subject for two days? <laughs> Anyway, that was so, when I look at that picture, I remember, I remember that terrified young man. Anyway, uh, it's always a privilege to talk at the, at the communion service. Today, especially because we have so many people, and also because there's four discipleship streams here. I've never, never heard of that happening before. So four different streams all here. So this is a message that I believe that God has led in my heart over the last six weeks, and it's taken me to write and rewrite and rewrite until I was finally happy that I, I was at peace with it. And it, it's, it's important for the whole church to hear, and I love it that this goes out on the internet. So I'm not only just speaking to yourselves, I'm speaking to our brothers and sisters. Um, but especially because all of you are here to learn and to grow to be disciples. A lot of you will probably end up being teachers and preachers, etc. And so I think for you especially, this message is very relevant. Anyway, I've called it, you have to plant flowers, you don't have to plant weeds. Jesus said that his words are spirit and life. Thus, we can say that his words are kingdom seeds that are packed with God's DNA. And yet, if we were to judge by falling church attendance, by a general sense of apathy, by lukewarmness and growing levels of unbelief and sin, we have to draw the conclusion that a substantial measure of that kingdom seed sown week after a week is not taking root and developing into Christian, into, into kingdom life. And I believe this is why. A farmer doesn't walk out onto his field and just start throwing seed all over an unplowed field. He knows that his seeds will not grow well enough there to produce a harvest. Jesus taught us that only when seed falls on unplowed, or sorry, sorry, Jesus taught that only when seed fall, falls on well plowed ground can it produce a good harvest. We all know the scriptures. Let me read it. Matthew 13, 3 to 8. Jesus said, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And the birds came and ate it. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. And then he said, still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He then went on to explain to his disciples what that parable meant. He said, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. 
when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands that this is the one who produces a crop, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Thus, hard ground, shallow soil, troubles and persecution, worry, and the deceitfulness of wealth are not good soil to try and throw kingdom seeds upon. In other words, it was only where the plow had first done its work that the seeds could be certain to produce their harvest. Indeed, when God gave the prophet Jeremiah his calling as a prophet, he instructed him to first thoroughly deal with the existing ground before building and planting upon it. Jeremiah 1, 9 to 10, God said to him, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot, tear down, destroy, and overthrow, and then to build and plant. We all come to the, king, we all come to the kingdom of God with some good soil, but also some unplowed hard ground, shallow soil, rocks, and weedy areas. And throwing good seed endlessly, week after week in church, onto that unplowed ground would, as Jesus said, mostly produce short-lived positive responses or growth with shallow roots, which was easily dislodged. As a farmer plows his field well before planting his seed, so our hearts need to be thoroughly and deeply plowed by good preaching, by challenging preaching, by anointed preaching, preaching the tough verses to break up the tough ground. Preaching the blessings only is throwing seed onto unplowed soil. For instance, simply sowing the seed, don't drink and drive, did not produce the hoped-for response. It turned out that it needed strong advertisements to show the consequences if the message was ignored that finally began to show results. Between, 70, between 1979 and 2009, road injuries and death in mainland Britain, where alcohol was involved, averaged 18,007 a year over all those years. But Thankfully, at last, in the last seven years, that average has dropped to 9,000. The message is finally beginning to bear fruit. Likewise with smoking. It, took, it finally took advertising, showing the terrible consequences to smokers and to others that finally produced a harvest of quitters. It seems that some truths only sink in when the soil is plowed with a sharp edge. <clears throat> The Word of God, when handled correctly and in the right spirit, is extremely sharp. Hebrews 4.12, for the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrows. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So unless we break up the hard ground, sometimes using hard truths which can offend our pride, the soil will remain hard or shallow. Jeremiah 4.3, this is what the Lord says to the people of Judah and to Jerusalem, break up your unplowed ground and do not sow among thorns. The hard ground in Jesus' parable was the path used virtually every day in the farmer's life, coming and going to his field. And I believe that this can equate to the habits, the lifestyle, and the comforts that make up our everyday lives. This everyday life that we've settled into can become what I call a silent and impenetrable comfort zone, 
we naturally settle into our comfort zone. Nice house, tick. Double glazing, tick. Car, maybe two cars, tick. Central heating, tick. Big TV, maybe two, maybe three, tick. Good friends, good church, tick, tick. Children doing well, tick. Saving for a nice holiday, tick. iPhone, Facebook, tick. And a Christian, tick. Heaven secured, tick. You see, it's funny, but actually God knows in our hearts where silent, silently we say, don't touch me, don't come past this point. It's not that we would say it or consciously think it, but in actual fact, we settle into that comfort zone. And God knows exactly where the line is, where anything that discomforts us in that zone is not going to be allowed to be seated at stairs solid. Our hearts always tell us we're okay. I'm doing good with the Lord. The Lord knows my heart. Jeremiah 79, the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Mm, Jesus can. And he asks for disciples not just, believe, not just believers. That's why he plowed deep into that hard ground as he sowed kingdom seed. You see, discipleship does not automatically come with time. It doesn't come with reading the Bible more or regularly attending church, though these are very, very good things. Jesus said discipleship comes with a cost. See, from Genesis Onwards, the Bible can be divided into scriptures about obedience and disobedience and the consequences of both. In a democratic society, making Jesus the Lord and master and ruler over every part of our lives and loves does not come naturally to us. We might call him Lord and repeat as a memory verse, Philippians 2.10, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, but often the full meaning abides in very shallow soil, if at all. Billy Graham plowed when he said, if he is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord at all. The wind and the waves obeyed Jesus. The demonic obeyed Jesus. If we still see his commands as an a la carte menu to pick and choose from, what does that make us? Jesus knows that the plow must dig deep here. Luke 6, 46, he said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And you don't do what I say. It's like a contradiction in terms. Luke 8, 19, 21. I always think this is a, an amazing scene to picture. Jesus is speaking to the crowd, and his mother and brothers arrive outside, and they're all, ex- they're all excited, saying, Oh, bring them in. Jesus will be delighted to see his mother and brothers. If you said what happens next and you hadn't read the Bible, you would get it wrong. Luke 8, 19 to 21. Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. So even though he loved his mother and his brothers, obedience to God always came above that. You see, Jesus gives us the gift of family and desires that we love them dearly, but never at the expense of putting them ahead of obedience to him. His words plow deep deliberately. Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, and we know that he doesn't mean hate, Wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And in Matthew 7, 21 to 22, Jesus plows even deeper into this this impenetrable area. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. 
The great Charles Haddon Spurgeon was not afraid to plow deeply on the issue of the lordship of Jesus. He said, if the professed convert distinctly and deliberately declares that he knows the Lord's will, but does not mean to attend to it, you are not to pamper his presumption. It is your duty to assure him that he is not saved. When we, but there's, there's more plowing to be done in this seemingly impenetrable ground of our comfort zone. Luke 14, 33, Jesus said, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciples. Now, when we hear that, does the blade hit an immovable rock? <laughs> Jesus is not saying that we give it away. If he, he might ask somebody to do that, but that's not what he's saying here about renouncing it. Way back in 1973, ITV brought out a groundbreaking documentary. If the money spent then was equated to today's money, it would be the most expensive documentary ever made. Um, it was called The World at War, a 26 episode um, of The World at War. And so because there was so much news about this documentary, this groundbreaking documentary, everybody was watching it. I remember as a little boy, or I don't know how, I can't work out my age, but I was a child. Um, I remember watching it, that first episode, and it was narrated by Laurence Olivier. And the first episode was about the growing rise of Nazism in Germany and what they were doing to the Jews, etc. And he said that Jews in other countries like Poland, France, the Netherlands, etc., they were all aware of the impending danger. And he said a lot of Jews left their houses and businesses and fled and they survived. He said, but a lot of Jews just couldn't leave their house and couldn't leave their business and they perished. But then he added in this sentence, which shows that they didn't own the houses or businesses, the houses or businesses owned them. And that's what Jesus means. Immorality is a big, strong no-no in the Bible. It is a relentless theme in the Bible, and yet surveys continue to show pornography is advancing like a flood throughout the church. Everyone knows it's sin, but hey-ho, it's life, isn't it? You know, in the past 30 years of attending church, I have heard one, one talk given all, all that time in church. Using the, the power of hyperbole, which means using extreme wording to ensure we understand the seriousness that we are to take the message. Listen to Jesus plow into that devil's playground. Matthew 5, 20 to 30. Jesus said, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in, in his heart. Then he says in this hyperbole, this extreme to make a point, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. That's pretty tough stuff, isn't it? But if Jesus is telling lies, then he is not the truth. Carter Conlon of Times Square Church is a man who plows deeply because he loves the Lord and he loves the Lord's people. He said, if you can go to church comfortable in your sin and come out the same way, you are going to the wrong church. God is the great forgiver. We know the price that Jesus paid that we might be forgiven, but he asks that we might pass that forgiveness on. The Lord's Prayer has the line, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. But to many, including myself for many years, this was only a memory verse. But unforgiveness probably hardens the heart more than anything else. It creates hard ground full of gravel and stones made up from anger and bitterness and malice and rage. Listen to Jesus plow that stony ground in Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. 
Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Then Jesus tells the parable of the unmerciful servant, which we all know, which ends with him saying this. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have a mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured, or some versions say tormented, until he should pay back all that he owed. Then Jesus finished by saying, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Lukewarmness, a bit of the world, a bit of the kingdom, is shallow soil. And so much worldliness has come into the church. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down, the gates are burnt, and the people in the church have gone walk about in the world, and the world has come walk about in the church. And there's that awful lukewarm mixture between the hot kingdom and the cold culture of the world. Jesus plowed straight into that in his message to the wealthy Laodicean church. You know it all. In fact, we sang a, a part of it on a a praise song there. Jesus said, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Can you imagine Jesus, who loves us more than anybody has ever walked this earth, saying that? You say, I am rich. I've acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. But you do not realize you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. These are shockingly tough words, but they're coming from a heart of love because Jesus continues with us. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. You see, Jesus will only discomfort those who are living the wrong way or heading the wrong way. I could go on. Jesus plowed deeply, as did Paul, as did Peter, as did John, throughout the epistles, as did the great preachers, writers, and revivalists such as Wesley Whitfield, Moody, Spurgeon, and Tozer. They knew that sowing without first plowing would be unfruitful. When preachers refuse to plow deeply with the Scripture's tougher, sharper words, lest they offend, they see little growth from the seed sown into their congregation. It seems that fleeing from the wrath to come and what Jesus said again and again about the reality of hell has quietly melted away. Vanilla church just isn't cutting it. I love teaching about the love of God but I know that if the fear of God becomes absent in our lives, we can all too easily ignore the tough blade of the plow. And my second book was the balance to my first one. Twice in John chapter 1, it states that Jesus came with grace and truth. So truth without grace is not kingdom teaching. And grace without truth is not kingdom teaching. We love the grace, but we can so easily flinch at a truth which discomfort us. The Apostle Paul in Acts 20, 27 said this, I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. The Amplified Version puts it this way, Therefore I testify and protest to you on this our parting day that I am clean and innocent and not responsible for the blood of any of you. For I never shrank or kept back or fell short from declaring to you the whole purpose and plan and counsel of God. After the plowing, of course, comes the sowing. Isaiah 28, 22 to 26 in the Living Bible. Listen to me. Listen as I plead. Does a farmer always plow and never sow? Is he forever harrowing the soil and never planting? Does he not finally plant his many kinds of grain, each in its own section of his land? He knows just what to do, for God has made him see and understand. You see, the Bible has words that plow and words that plant. We need our hearts to be yearning, longing for every morsel of kingdom seed to be sown into the good soil of our hearts. 
Kingdom seeds that in due season can produce beautiful flowers such as a passion for truth and integrity, a love for the unlovely, compassion for the lost, clean hands and a pure heart, kindness, patience, humility, and gentleness coming from spiritual strength, thankfulness in all circumstances, which Paul said is the will of God for our lives, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, righteous behavior, making righteous choices, always sowing to righteousness in our choices, Courage in an ever-threatening culture. Faithfulness to God, to family, to friends, and servant-hearted. Let me finish by mentioning weeds, and let me, let me tell you my first attempt at gardening. Um, when Linda and I uh, got our house, um, it was one of these new builds, and so there was a, a, just a, a rectangular garden with just a rectangle of grass they'd sown in it. That was it, not a flower which didn't bother me. But then as other houses were built, they had lovely little flower gardens, lovely flowers, and ours was just grass. So I began to feel that I was letting the side down. So I thought, right, I'm going to plant a flower garden. So I got a sharp spade and I went out and the neighbor's neighbor's hedge up this side here. So I I dug a semicircle about half the size of the stage up here. And the soil was good soil. I got everything out, every stone out, every gravel. I got that soil absolutely beautiful. I was so pleased with myself. And then I went to the garden center and I bought flowers. And you think they're very big because they come in a pot. Then you take them out and you put them down. And you've got these tiny little flowers growing in the midst of all this soil. But, but I thought, hey, ho, they'll grow. And I was very busy at the time just with, um, you know, raising family, work sport, all the things that were in my life at the time. And I remember going out and seeing these cute little green leaves, tiny little green leaves appearing everywhere. And I thought, I wonder what those are. Can't remember planting those. And I took my eyes off and I was that busy. And the next time I went out, I couldn't see the flowers. <laughs> it was just a weed bed, a solid weed bed. So, so I thought, oh goodness. So I got my spade, and I went out to try and sort this out, but the roots were so hard and settled in that even getting one out, and after about an hour with only clearing a wee bit like that, I thought, I can't do this. I had an idea. Don't do this at home. I went and bought a gallon of petrol. (laughs) I was just married. What did I know about anything? And I poured the petrol all over the whole semicircle. I thought, this will nuke them. I'd been used to methylated spirits where you actually lit it and there was a wee gentle flame. So I threw a match in this and, <laughs> whoa, up it went. <laughs> I'm not sure my eyebrows <laughs> survived, but, but, but I mean, it actually, it actually frightened me. The flame was so high and, and so hot. I thought, what have I done? What have I done? But it all settled down and sure enough, and, and sure enough, all the, everything was burnt. The problem was, it still didn't, didn't deal with the roots. It still left me to go, to go and have them dig them all out. But that wasn't the worst thing that happened because the next day when I looked out, I noticed that the neighbor's hedge that he had planted about six months earlier <laughs> was beginning to singe and the leaves were starting. I thought, oh. <laughs> but I thought, well, he can't see it from his side. I can see it from his side. looks green. But the next day I looked out and this was advancing advancing all the way through. And then the third day I looked out and there he was looking on the other side of the hedge like this here. Just, you could see him like, <laughs> I thought, right, <laughs> I'd better go in and, uh, and just immediately apologize. So I knocked on his door thinking I'm very nice to him and tell him I've never gardened before. He'll be nice, but he wasn't. He wasn't. <laughs> he wasn't. He wasn't. And I understood that he had spent time and money planting this hedge, watering it for six months and in one fell swoop with my gallon of petrol. <laughs> I wiped his hedge out. So, but here's the point. I planted the flowers in the good soil. I didn't plant the weeds, but they came and they multiplied and they quickly took over the good soil in my flower bed. Weeds will seed in flower beds with delight, of course, but they're just as happy to squeeze into cracks in concrete or burst up through tarmac driveways. You don't ask your neighbor for a cutting from that fine weed. (laughs) 
but in due time, you'll probably get us all spring in your garden anyway. We have a brick, uh, paved, a brick paved driveway, so there are a thousand tiny gaps able to be occupied. I, I've got considerably better at gardening over the years, and one reason is I've learned about weed control. I counted, I've been out five times so far in these past few months, spraying the weeds all around the, the driveway everywhere with various weed killers or pulling the blighters out by root from flower beds, patio and driveway, but they just keep coming. So I've learned that you have to plant flowers. You don't have to plant weeds. You see, fallen man's nature is awash with weeds as our default position. You don't have to teach a child to lie. You have to root out that weed and deliberately plant and then carefully nurture a passion for truth and integrity. You don't have to teach a child to be selfish. You have to root out that weed and deliberately plant and then carefully nurture the flower of sharing. Until we get to heaven, we will always be at war with weeds. Weeds such as pride, such as grumbling, complaining, and murmuring, such as gossiping, lukewarmness, unbelief, worldliness, envy and jealousy, greed and stinginess, loving the world in its ways, hypocrisy, anger, malice, rage, bitterness, lies, even little white lies. These are the weeds that just can come up very subtly. The Apostle Paul wrote about us weeding in our lives in 2 Corinthians um, 6, 17 to 7, 1. He, he finished by saying this, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Enough said. So I would say this, please, please, let us all willfully and deliberately ask God to ply where he needs to ply. And let us ask the Holy Spirit to show us where we need to weed. And may God be glorified in our lives. Amen.